Okay, so Lily here will tell us about stability problems in general relativity. Thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about stability problems in general relativity. I think this is a good place to talk about general relativity. And so first, let's look at the famous einstein vacuum equations. So uh, it brings the Einstein tensor associated to the metric plus a multiple of the metric is zero. So if it is not vacuum, the right hand side is not zero, it is replaced by an energy vector tensor in this space time. So here, this G is the Lorentzian metric, because for the physics relevance, we would like to work in the dimension three plus one. Three means the spatial dimension, one means the dimension of the time. So we have the signature minus plus plus plus. And also here, this multiple lambda is the cosmological constant. So Today, we will focus on the case where the cosmological constant is zero. So this equation is a highly non-trivial equation. And uh, even looking for an explicit solution is not an easy work. But we indeed have some explicit solutions. So the first one is the flat space-time, which is the Minkowski space-time. So the Minkowski metric is just the analog of the Euclidean metric in the Riemannian setting. And the more interesting one is a Schwarzschild black holes. So it is a family of black hole solutions, which is parametrized by a mass parameter, which is always greater than zero. And in fact, the Schwarzschild family is a subfamily of a larger family, which is called the curve family of black holes. So this family is parametrized first by a mass parameter and also by angular momentum parameter. So if the angular momentum is zero, so it reduces to a Schwarzschild uh, black hole. So if the mass parameter is zero, we have the Minkowski space time. So this is why I have this kind of like uh, index zero, zero. It means that mass parameter is zero and also angular momentum parameter is zero. Okay, so now let's look at the Schwarzschild metric in more detail. So here, if you look at the expression, so we have this expression of the Schwarzschild metric, if you like. So if you just look at the form of this metric, it seems that we have a singularity when r is zero and also when r is 2m. So here, r is zero is a real singularity because we have a curvature block there. But the singularity r minus r equals 2m is just a part of the singularity. So we can, so. So we can extend, in fact, the manifold beyond r equals 2m and to get the whole kind of like picture of the extended manifold. So this gray region is the black hole region, and this green region is the exterior. So we call this region the exterior region. So this r equals 2m is a boundary which separates the exterior region and also the black hole region. So those boundary is called the event horizon. And also here you could see if r is large enough, this is a light cone which is the important object when you are studying the Lorentz metric. So the light cone here, when R is very large, it looks like that in the Minkowski space-time. Okay, because light cone is so important, so I would like to talk about it a bit more. Uh, a bit more. So here, in Lorentz metric, so the causal relation is very important. So we always use the light cone to study the causal relation because it just provides us uh, with a very clear picture. And so in the Lorentz metric, if we have a vector field, sorry, and it's very different from in the Riemannian setting. If it is non-zero, we know that norm in the Riemannian setting is always greater than zero, but in the Lorentz setting, it could be zero or negative or positive. So if the norm of the vector field is less than zero, we see that the time, it is time-like. It is zero, we see that it is not or light-like. So if it is positive, it is space-like. So here you have this light cone. So if uh, we see, so from the picture, you could see that light light vector field is always inside the light cone. And also the non vector field is at the boundary of the light cone. And also the space-like vector, vector is outside the light cone. And also once we have this kind of like the characterization of this vector field, we can also consider the corresponding curve, the light light curve the non-curve and also the space-like curve. So it has meaning in reality. So in reality, we, so people can be regarded as an observer in universe. So we use the time-like curve to model the observer. And also we use the non-curve to model the light wave. 
So here, this means that, okay, we are interested in the causal curves, which is the like time-like curves and also non-curves. The information just propagates along either time-like curves or non-curves. So if we look at, just go back to the structure setting. So as I said before, when R is large, this is like cone. It just looks like that in the Minkowski space-time. And when we are closer and closer to the event horizon R equals 2M, the light cone just tilts more and more, such that when you, across, when you cross the event horizon, and you could see that if you look at just the, the trajectory of light, time light curve, so it cannot go back to the exterior region. So it has to go to the real singularity. So this is why we call this region black hole region, because it cannot communicate with the exterior region. So it, uh, the light cannot escape from this region. And okay, so this is already very kind of like, uh, exciting, but we are looking for more because if you go back to look at the expression of the short chart, so it is stationary. So the coefficient doesn't depend on the time t. So there is no dynamics in it. If you officially have this metric, it's, a, it's always like this for later time. But we are interested in the dynamics of the Einstein vacuum equations. So here, one way to study kind of like the dynamics of the Einstein vacuum equations is try to consider this from the PDE perspective. So, and then you can try to write the Einstein vacuum equations in the local coordinates. So if we do this, we will get a very generous second order differential equations. And if you just look at this form, it doesn't have any kind of like specific structure. But good news is that, okay, Einstein vacuum equations are tensorial. So we have the different morphism invariants, and we can just choose our favorite coordinates. For example, the wave coordinates. So in this coordinates, the Einstein vacuum equations can be written as a system of nonlinear hyperbolic equations. So once we do this, and then we can just uh, come like ask the same questions we would ask for a nonlinear wave equations. So example, so we always want, so we so we always start come like the initial value problem of if you are given a nonlinear wave equations. So you can ask the same questions for the Einstein vacuum equations. And first, you have to formulate the initial value problem for the Einstein vacuum equations. For example, what is the initial data? So for the Einstein vacuum equations, the initial data is a little bit complicated. So the initial data is given as first a three-dimensional manifold, and then a Riemannian metric H, and also a symmetric tensor K in the three dimension. And this is regarded as the initial data. And then you want to solve this equation, which has this initial data, means that you want to look for a solution, of course, which solves the Einstein vacuum equations. And also we expect that, okay, this sigma zero is embedded space-like hypersurface of the whole space-time M. So here space-like hypersurface means that it's normal, is time-like. And also we expect that uh, the H is kind of like the initial value of G in the geometric meaning, which means that, okay, the H is the induced metric of G as the initial hypersurface. And the K is the second fundamental form. So here you can try to make an analog between this and also the standard initial value problem of the wave equations. The H is kind of like the U of zero, and also the K is like DTU at zero. And but there is a difference. So for initial value problems of our wave equations, you can just impose the initial data fully, but you cannot do this for the Einstein vacuum equations. So the initial data has to satisfy the so-called Einstein constraint equations. So it just the gauss cordazi equation for the hypersurface combined with the Einstein vacuum equations. So for this, so by the way, so the Einstein constraint equations is just a system of elliptic equations. So this, uh, this system on its own is also a very interesting problem and it has been studied extensively using some techniques from geometric analysis. Okay, so once we have a good formulation of the initial value problem for Einstein vacuum equations, and then we can ask the first natural question. So can we have the local well-posedness of this equation? So this answer, this question, uh, so this question was answered 
a shock in 1952. So it says that, okay, if you have initial data which is sufficiently regular, which means, okay, it has, it, we just measure this regularity in some soft space with high regularity. And also, of course, so we require this initial data to satisfy the constraint equations. And then you have, we can solve the SM vacuum equations locally. And if we really want to talk about the uniqueness of the equation of the solution, so we have to uh, module the different morphisms. And the, the idea of the proof is like, so first we write the Einstein vacuum equations as a system of wave equations, <laughs> wave coordinates. And then you just want to study the initial value problem. So here, um, if we go back to the come like the initial data, so it is a just a metric, many a metric in three dimensional space, and k also is come like a metric, is a come like three by three matrix matrix. But you, if you want to study this initial value problems for the g, so here you have to impose the value g at t equals zero, it is a four by four matrix. And also you have to impose the value DTG is also a four by four matrix. And then how do you prepare this data? So you have some freedom, but we also need to do some arrangement, which means that you have to prepare this data in a proper way. For example, you have to make sure you impose the, the, the data for G and DTG such that the metric satisfies the wave coordinate condition initially. And once you have this initial data, you just solve the corresponding initial value problem for wave for a system of wave equations, and you get a solution. And then you have to go back to ask, is this solution really a solution to the Einstein vacuum equations? And then you have to prove that, okay, the wave coordinate condition just propagate. So once it holds initially, so it holds true for all later time, which means that, okay, the initial, the solution you get for the wave equations is indeed also a solution to the Einstein vacuum equations. So this is how you get the local solution to the Einstein vacuum equations. Okay, now we have the local repulsiveness of the Einstein vacuum equations. So the second natural question would be, what about the global repulsiveness? So what about the long time dynamics? How can you see the long time behavior of the solution? So the long time dynamics, Okay, so and uh, related to this, the study of the long time dynamics, so there is kind of like a big conjecture which is called final state conjecture. So this conjecture says, okay, if we have a very general initial data and we want to say that, okay, first, uh, with this given initial data, we have a global solution to the Einstein vacuum equation. And if you want to study the long time dynamics, the uh, behavior of the solution, we expect the solution to be decomposed into a finite number of curved black holes plus some decaying terms, which is called the gravitational radiation. And in order to resolve this conjecture, we must have a deep understanding of the following kind of like aspects. For example, if the final state conjecture were true, we would expect the small data to not concentrate. So this is related to the state stability of Minkowski space time, which, is, which was first proved by Christodor and Kleinman in 1993. And, and then the other side is for the large data. So what do we expect for large data? So for large data, we would expect it leads to a solution to concentrate to produce black holes. So this is related to the gravitational class. So, uh, in a more precise way, so uh, it means that, okay, we, we want to ask, so can black holes form from a reasonable initial data, specifically from initial data which doesn't contain a black hole? So here I said the trap surface because usually the trap surface just detected a black hole. And also this also was proven first by Christelo in 2009. And also, we would expect all the stationary states are curved black holes, which is kind of like the, we would expect the curved black holes as the only candidates for your asymptotic date, for your final state, uh, state. And also, since we expect the curved black holes as the only candidates for the kind of like final state, a natural question would be that, okay, we would expect curved solutions to be stable, which means that, okay, 
small perturbation of the current initial data just leads to a, also a pure black hole, but which is not the same black hole as before. It could be a nearby black hole. So in this talk, I will just focus on the fourth question, which is the stability of curve. Of course, there are even more complex problems, which is related to the final state projection, because for, lot, for all of this, it, they are mostly related to the exterior region of the space time. So there are even more interesting problems, which is related to the interior region, which is the black hole region of the space time. Okay, so for the stability curve, so this is a, uh, there is a conjecture which is called the stability again of the exterior curve. So it conjectures that okay, if we just uh, perturb a uh, exterior curve a little bit, so here we have a, a constraint of this curve of the parameter when a is less than m. This is the substremal curve because we cannot expect the same thing for the extremal curve when a is m or even where a is greater than m. We did so we don't expect such a stability. So typically when we study the probability uh, the, the stability of curve, so we can study this at three days, uh, stages. So the first one is kind of like the most stability. This is what the physicists always do. So they just do the separation of variables and then say, okay, there is no exponential growing over and they will contain. They say, okay, everything is done. But this is not what mathematician is kind of like aiming for. So we are really care about the real stability in the mathematics sense. And of course, the most stability is even not about the Einstein equation, it's about the linearized Einstein equation. So maybe the third step is about the linear stability of the real linear equation, and then go from the linear stability to non-linear stability. For, from, so from one step, to one further step. So every step is non trivial. For example, from the mode stability to linear stability, it involves, for example, the even the sum of the mode. So it's non trivial. And also from linear stability to non linear stability, it's even more non trivial because if you want to deal with the non linear stability, you have to consider the non linear interaction and also the gauge issue and so on and so forth. So, so far for the most stability is true for all the substremal range. So it was proven by Whiting in 1989. But for the non-linear stability, so it was only proved recently by George Kleinman, Schottel, and Shen, and saying that, okay, the slowly rotating case, which means that A is sufficiently small, so the non-linear stability is true. So my, so my interest is kind of like the, how to remove this smallness assumption for the A for the non-linear stability. Okay, I think I can stop here. Thank you. Speaker. What is the Einstein vacuum equation? Trying to I I know nothing about physics except wanting to ask. Oh, so yeah. for example, you have, if you have a very kind of like condensed come like star, for example, the sun. So you have a come like a very large mass, but the volume is come like very small. And then if you are far away from this sun, so the space time can be modeled by the structure of metric. If you look at come like a metric at that point, so it can be, so it can be modeled by the structure of metric. Okay, exactly. Okay. 